Luke chapter 2. It's been our joy to journey with Luke for the Christmas season. We have one final message from him. Luke chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. In writing about the gift of reading, author C.S. Lewis said the following, My own eyes are not enough for me. I will see through the eyes of others. My own eyes are not enough for me. I will see through those of others. Pause for just a moment and consider that sentence. Turn it over in your mind. Do you believe that? Do you believe that your own eyes, your own perspective, is not enough, is insufficient? Because what is about to happen depends a great deal on whether you believe that to be true or not. All of us are prone, tempted to assume that our own eyes, our own perspective, our own insights are enough. But when we come to God's Word, we must lay aside that assumption and humbly agree with Lewis that we need a different perspective. We need to see through other eyes. We need to see beyond what we can see on our own. And so when we begin reading God's Word, we must come with this, this humble assumption that we were intended by God to see through the eyes of another. This morning, we have the privilege to meet an elderly woman named Anna. And God invites us to see through her divinely inspired perspective. But first, we must admit to ourselves and to the Lord that Lewis is right. Our own eyes, and make this very personal, my own eyes are not enough. But, by the grace of God, through the Holy Spirit of God, this morning, we will see through the eyes of another. With that expectation, let's begin reading Luke 2, verse 36. And there was a prophetess, Anna the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up, at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of Him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Lord, illuminate this preaching of Your Word. It's important to have a little bit of context, which you know because we've been walking through this wonderful chapter over the last couple of weeks, uh, this scene takes us to the temple in Jerusalem. Perhaps 40 days or so after the birth of Jesus Christ, the parents, Mary and Joseph, have brought the child, probably for purification and for a dedication. According to the law of Moses, they were faithful Jews, and they had come into the temple, and having come in, they had already been uh, greeted by the man Simeon, who had declared that this was indeed God's Messiah. He actually announced in the passage that Bart read at the opening of our service this morning that he could now freely go home to be with the Lord, freely depart, because God's word to him had proved true. His eyes had beheld the Messiah, the coming one. 
And that picks up in verse 36 when it says, at that same moment, this woman, Anna, comes into the scene. Anna is an elderly woman. She lived her life under the rule and government of the Roman Empire, currently under the dominion of Caesar Augustus, even more painfully perhaps under the dominion of the, the cruel appointee Herod the Great. She was of the tribe of Asher, one of the ten lost tribes in the exile. And this story about her initially is one of incredible contrast. We need to understand the story. So let's walk through the story and then we'll apply it to our lives. It's one of, of a contrast of great need and yet great hope. Of vulnerability and yet faith. Even the names at the beginning of this story indicate this contrast. The name Anna means grace or favor. She is the daughter of one Phanuel. Phanuel means the face of God or turning to God. She's of the tribe of Asher, one of the tribes of Israel promised God's blessing. And so these names right at the outset convey this idea of, of God's favor and blessing and grace over his people. Even the, the hope and the promise of seeing God, the hope of every Israelite, that God's countenance would shine upon them. And yet, there is a note of weakness and vulnerability as well. Asher was one of the tribes lost when God's people rebelled against God. It's actually remarkable that there were some descendants who had kept a record of their family lineage. So there is at the same time these reminders that God's people had wandered from him, had been lost, had been exiled, and here's one of the remnants, the remaining survivors of this tribe, and yet there is a remnant, there is this survivor, there's a sense of hope and vulnerability, of tragedy and of faith present in these names. Somehow, even down to the modern day, there are people still naming their children names that remind them of the grace of God and the promise of God for his people, and yet... The context where they live is under the dominion of Rome, under the subjugation of Herod the Great, and even her own personal story. We could say it mirrors the tragedy of God's people. She was married likely at a very young age in those days. She lived with seven, her husband for seven years, and the phrasing is somewhat difficult, and then as a widow until she was 84. That could mean that she is now 84 years old. More likely, uh, the alternative translation is accurate, that she actually lived as a widow for 84 years, which would put her over 100 years old. In either case, she is an elderly woman having lived the vast majority of her life in the loss of widowhood. Now, we need to... We need to take off our modern spectacles and put on our, our first century perspective. Widowhood in this day and age uh, was not a temporary tragedy, but was a, a condition of great vulnerability and need. Certainly that is true of any, of any widow or widower today where there is a loss, there is a, a weakness, but I'm not sure we can fully appreciate the vulnerability, even the sense of, of shame that might be attached to this woman who has spent a lifetime without the comfort and protection of her husband. She had it briefly and then she lost it and she never regained another. Not like the story of Ruth. This widow had no kinsman redeemer who would spread his protection over her. She would meet no Boaz in the field to watch over her and to lift her up and to provide for her. No, she would be alone decade after decade. In that sense, Luke chooses her intentionally. God chooses her intentionally as a kind of a physical representation of his people. Like God's people, she had had a moment, even it would seem a brief moment of blessing, followed by years, a lifetime, we could say, of loss and tragedy and loneliness and vulnerability. Her life mirrors the experience of God's people at this time, without protection, without covering, without a chosen godly king to watch over them. They are like him. And yet, in her loss, she has not allowed her need to turn her towards bitterness or self-pity or anger. Instead, 
she has committed her lifetime to expressing faith in the God of her fathers. Notice what it says. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. We can imagine this woman decade after decade coming in the morning in a time of prayer, smelling the sacrifices and lifting up her own voice to the Lord. We can only imagine that she is offering prayers of gratefulness for her survival, the survival of at least a remnant of her tribe as a token of God's preserving grace. We can imagine her gratefulness that there is a temple in which to offer sacrifices. We can imagine her repeating the Psalms that proclaim the beauty of the King and longing for the day when the son of David would come again. We're told in verse 36 that she is a, a prophetess, a somewhat surprising description given that there has been no formal prophet in Israel writing God's word for 400 years. But this woman has been given a divine anointing to speak for the Lord, to see as God would allow her to see beyond natural sight. You can imagine her Remembering the Exodus. Remembering the conquest of Canaan. Remembering God's presence overshadowing the temple in Jerusalem. We can, we can imagine her fasting. Setting aside meals to plead with the God of her fathers to return again. Imagine her meditating on the scriptures that predict the coming of a Messiah and, and, and in her loneliness, in her vulnerability, crying out to God to come again to His people, to fulfill the promise that the glory of God would re-enter the temple of the Lord, that they would be restored, that their fortunes would be reversed. We can, we can imagine this elderly woman day after day worshiping the God of steadfast love and pleading with Him to fulfill his promise and to bring his anointed one to his people and to raise them up from the ashes and set them in a high place again. We can imagine, we can imagine the regularity of the temple attendants seeing this woman shuffling in. We can imagine her voice raised in worship and in desperate prayer. Hour goes by when others scurry to their midday meals. She is still there praying, interceding. Please, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, send the Messiah. Send him. Restore. Restore our fortunes, O Lord. Come again to your people. Do not leave us outside of your presence. Shine the light of your face on us again. Give us redemption. Rescue us, Yahweh. Year after year, she has worshipped, prayed, and fasted. And one morning, one morning just like many mornings, for decades, she comes in to the temple. Try to imagine it. She comes into the temple suddenly by divine inspiration. She sees him. She is at least 84, perhaps over 100 years old. Simeon is exulting. Perhaps her friend, perhaps well known to her, exulting that the Messiah has come and she perceives that is the answer of every prayer. The text says she came up at that very hour. We can imagine the Lord smiling as he watches this divine non-coincidence. As he watched her shuffling toward the temple, 
As he watched her eyes round the corner and catch sight of the young couple and the old godly Simeon. And here is this child. And she can imagine the voice of the Lord speaking into her soul. This is the one. There. There he is. There he is. There is your Redeemer. There is the answer to your prayers. There is your Boaz, your kinsman, Redeemer, your covering. There is your King. There he is. And out of decades of praying, there burst forth from her a song of thanksgiving. She began, it says, to give thanks to God. You can only imagine, you can only imagine this elderly woman suddenly lifting up her voice in a shout and declaring, He has come. The mighty Savior has come. The Lord has come. The Lord has visited His people. It says she began to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. She apparently has a, a crew of fellow interceders, of fellow prayer warriors, fellow saints waiting and longing for this great day to come. And she finds them quickly and she tells them based on her divine, divinely authorized status as a prophet as he has come. I have seen him. I have seen him with my eyes. The Lord has returned to his people. The anointed has come. The Redeemer has come. The redemption we've been waiting for, it has arrived. Imagine her veined hand gripping arm after arm. He has come. Simeon has seen it too. Our prayers have been answered. He's only a baby now. But one day he will be a man, and he is the anointed one. Imagine her ancient voice bouncing off the walls of the temple, joining with the smoke of the sacrifices in declaring glory to God in the highest, peace, shalom to his people, the hesed love of God has come again to his people, and she as a remnant a small remnant of the tribe of Asher thought lost can declare God has restored blessing to his people and indeed as my father was named I have seen the face of God shining on his people again. What a moment. What a moment. Listen, we have to see through her we have to see through her eyes. Our own perspective is not enough. We are familiar, are we not, with the baby Jesus. We are familiar with the story of redemption, the story of salvation, and our hearts grow quickly comfortable and familiar with the glory of this news. And so, as Lewis said, our own eyes are not enough. We need to see through the eyes of another. And so God gives us the gift of this elderly woman so that we can see through her eyes, and so the effect of that sight can affect us as well. We can be affected as she was affected because seeing the Redeemer should always compel us to abundant thanksgiving, should it not? Amen. And when we see her, her looking at him and we see him through her eyes, the effect it had on her soul should be translated to us. We should experience some of her joy. We should, we should join this elderly dear saint and let our voices abound with thanksgiving as well. Seeing what she sees, we should be compelled to thanksgiving because of the coming of Christ as well. Brothers and sisters, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ should always thrill our souls, should always compel us to abundant thanksgiving. There should, be, there should be voices bouncing off every wall where a Christian is proclaiming the thanksgiving that is due the Lord for the sending of His Son. How do we do this? How do we 
get in on her joy? What does it look like to see the coming of the Savior through her perspective, to be affected as she was affected, to see through her eyes? You make three points. First of all, we need to remember our need for Christ. We need to remember our need of Christ. Like this woman, we have a radical need. We have a radical need. And there is no joy or thanksgiving or glory in the coming of Jesus if there is neglect of remembering our need. That's true of a, a Christian or even if you're here and you're just uh, excited about attending church in the holiday season, uh, that's true of you as well. If you don't understand, if we don't understand our need for Christ, we will not be grateful for Him. We need to review our need. This woman is a physical depiction of our need as well. She lived under the rule of a foreign power. So did we in the spiritual realm. We live under the dominion and reign of sin. Like her, she had no, no national independence from that dominion. We had no independence from the dominion, the rule of sin. God's people in this day and age were under the subjugation of Rome because of their sin, and we were under the subjugation of the evil one in a condemnation because of our sin. We were not free. We were slaves. We were under the dominion of another, like she was. Like her, our heritage is one of exile and loss. She could not look back on her tribe and see a family history of faithful godliness. And ultimately, we cannot either. As we look back through the heritage of humanity, we can see loss and exile in our past as well. Like her, there is no redeemer for us apart from Christ. Not all of us are physically widows or widowers. But all of us are alone without God. We conceal that feeling by parties and human friendships, but all of us were made to have the covering of God over us. And apart from the coming of Christ, none of us did. People in this world can say whatever they want about the fatherhood of God for all people and the connection they feel to God in the woods and so forth. It is it is simply a self-deceit to hide from themselves the fact that God is far from them because they are far from Him. We need to see our need. Like her, we are lonely, vulnerable, without hope and without God. If I can speak to you personally, if you're here, maybe you're a young person, maybe you're a guest of us this morning, we're glad that you're here. Maybe you, you are here and you know about Jesus but you are not close to him. There is no joy of seeing your Redeemer when you read passages like this about Jesus. Let me speak to you personally. You have a need that only Jesus can satisfy. You, you have a loss that only he can remove. You have a vulnerability that only Jesus can turn into thanksgiving. Because you are a sinner. You are a Rebel in your soul and in your life, away from the God who is life, and the coming of this Savior, like it was for Anna, is good news for you. It means that the God who sees your rebellion also came in Himself to call you back to Himself. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let me appeal to you don't live. Decades of your life alone and far from God. You have a need for Christ. And Christ has come to meet your need. Amen. To redeem you. To rescue you. To lift you up from your grave. From your personal exile. From your, we might even say, spiritual widowhood. And to bring you to himself. Amen. To claim you for himself. 
to cover you with his salvation, to forgive all your sins, to lift you up from your shame, and to set you in a place of privilege and glory and beauty. Listen, if you don't know Jesus as your Redeemer, Anna would like to introduce you to him. She would like you to experience her joy. She would like you to experience the kind of thankfulness that build up in her heart. But you first have to remember your need for him. Brothers and sisters, Christians, let me speak directly to you. Listen, if you haven't spent time recently remembering what your life would be like without the coming of Jesus Christ, it is no wonder if your thankfulness for him has declined of late. If you haven't spent some time, not all of your time, but some time considering and remembering what would my life be if Christ had not unredeemed, unrescued, and alone. Working hard to pretend like all is well when all is not well. Let me urge you. Let me urge you. Remember your need of Christ. And that will lead you to give thanks the way that He does. You have to remember our need of Christ. Secondly, we have to Renew our devotion to Christ. We have to renew our devotion to Christ. Notice again that Anna does not depart from the temple worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. I don't think that likely means that she was literally there 24-7. It's an expression of con continuity. She was continually there. It was as though her, her waking hours, when she had time to spare, when she possibly could, she was devoting herself to the presence of God, to the nearness of God, to the worship of God, to interceding towards God for His people. People, to the celebration of God's promises. That was the, the characteristic of her life. That's what defined her. Devotion to the Lord. And it's no wonder that that devotion led to the abundant thanksgiving we see at the end of the passage. She was devoted to Him. And if we consider the God she was devoted to and the information she had, it is provoking to us to consider how much more information we have about that Redeemer than she did. She was devoted to the God who rescued Egypt, rescued his people from Egypt in the Exodus. She was devoted to the God of Isaiah. She was devoted to the God of David, who had seen symbols and signs of what God was going to do. She saw in the coming of Jesus a, a human ruler that somehow would represent the Lord coming to his people to redeem them. But she did not have, could not have had, all of the information that we have in blazing clarity about how Jesus would redeem his people. Brothers and sisters, should not we who live between the comings of Jesus be devoted as she was? Should not we who live after his first coming, having seen all that he did to redeem his people, he battled with the devil in the wilderness, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he conquered demons, he died on a cross to rescue sinners. Shouldn't we have great cause for worshiping and prayer and fasting night and day, longing for his return? Listen, as we come into a new year, this is a, this is a good woman to get to know. Because our lives should be characterized by the same devotion to the same Redeemer. Because we have even more information to pour into those intercessions. We too can pray, Lord, renew your people. Lord, rescue those who are still in exile. Lord, we are worshiping your name for your redemption. Lord, we are celebrating your arrival. Lord, we want to devote ourselves to you. Because you are the glorious and coming King. We lift up your name. We declare that you are worthy of our praise. We declare that you are the exalted Savior, the Son of Man, the Son of David, the King, Messiah. We declare that there is no one like you. Listen, that's what Hannah was praying. Without any of the, the information about Calvary and the resurrection that we now have. If 
we want to see what she saw, we have to renew our devotion to him. Listen, it, it's not surprising if we notice thankfulness for the Lord Jesus waiting our hearts. If our lives are not characterized by this kind of devotion to him and intercession for his people and celebration of his promises. Now, now not all of us are, are widows who are called to basically live at a physical temple. None of us are first century Jews uh, living when there was a physical temple, no. But we are, we are all of us called to have our lives marked by devotion to him. We, we are all of us called to have lives marked by this kind of worshipful, prayerful exaltation and adoration. We are all called to see him the way she did. If we would see what she sees, we must have her devotion characterizing our lives. We must remember our need of Christ. We must renew our devotion to Christ. And we must revive our thanksgiving for Christ. I wanted to leave some time here at the end to zero in on this phrase that she began to give thanks to God. Listen, the major note of the New Testament is one of thanksgiving. And as a church, we have a tradition of seizing on a passage that talks about thanksgiving at the end of the year because thanksgiving, I believe, is the hidden secret of Christian maturity. Thanksgiving is the hidden secret of Christian maturity, and thanksgiving above all for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving for the grace of God revealed in the redemption that was affected by Jesus Christ. If we want to see through her eyes, and more importantly, see from God's perspective, then we must allow that perspective to shape us and transform us into people grateful for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his return as well. We must be a people that are, that are shaped and affected by gratefulness for the Lord, gratefulness for his redemption. Let me, let me ask us to consider this as the first and primary goal of our coming new year, that we would be a people grateful as she was for the coming of Jesus Christ, for the dying of Jesus Christ, for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, for the promises of his return. This is your calling. To give thanks to God and to speak of him. This is our privilege. Let's imagine our daily lives as if we were at her side there in that moment at the temple. Because in a very real spiritual sense, since every Christian is a temple of the Holy Spirit, we are indeed at her side every moment of every day. Let's imagine our daily lives there at her side, having seen the coming of the Redeemer, what is an appropriate lifestyle of response? Well, certainly it is one of thanksgiving. It is one of gratefulness. It is one of joy. Certainly our voices should echo with the song of thanksgiving and celebration. Certainly our, our hearts should be seen as one of great gladness for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Surely our conversations should be like hers. We were speaking of him to those who are waiting for his ultimate redemption. Surely this should be true of every Christian. Brothers and sisters, is thankfulness for Christ the mark of your conversation? Is it the mark of your joy? Are you compelled to thankfulness? We have great reason to join her song in giving thanks for him. 
seeing what she sees. Here is the kinsman redeemer. Here is the mighty son of David. Here is the restorer of the lost fortunes of God's people. Here is the one who will cover over his weak one with his love. Here is the one who loves our souls. Here is the one who has searched out the lost sheep and the widows and given them a home. Here is the father to the fatherless. Here is this one. And do we not have great reason to give thanks for him? Brothers and sisters, are you marked, known, characterized by gratefulness for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you letting this perspective turn you into a gospel grateful Christian? But thankfulness is not just a, a discipline of self control, it is that. But it is also an effect of looking at the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's, there's no great mystery to gratefulness and having a grateful life. There, there's no great, great concealment of how that takes place. It comes through looking and then disciplining our hearts and our tongues to respond in gratefulness. It, it's a very simple two-step process. We look at Him and consider what He has done to redeem us, to save us, to rescue us, to take on our flesh and die our death and raise us ultimately to heaven. And then we allow that to affect our souls in gratefulness. If we fail to look to Him, we will tend to look elsewhere and everywhere else there is great cause for discouragement. But looking at him, there is great cause for joy and gratefulness. If we look at him, but we resist the, the nature of that look to compel us to gratefulness, we can restrain gratefulness or limit it or subdue it. And so we have to have these, these two steps in place. We must look to him, and then we must respond in gratefulness. Let me speak to you in, in our various roles that we have. Husbands, let me speak to you about how you speak to your wives. Do you speak to your wife in the, the language that Anna used that day, of gratefulness for the coming of the Lord Jesus. Husbands, are you, are you regularly communicating your gratefulness that there is a Savior for your spouse? That there is grace to cover her sins? That there is a Redeemer for her discouragement? That there is hope for her? In every moment, up and down of life, in her, her burdens that she faces on a daily basis. Is, is this the language of your voice? Gratefulness for the coming of the Lord Jesus and the difference it makes in her life. Wives, are you speaking this way to your husbands of gratefulness to the Lord Jesus? That as he is discouraged and burdened and worried and convicted and concerned, that there is, there is joy and gratefulness, that there is a Savior for him. There is a Redeemer for him. He need not be overcome and burdened by his failures or the failures of others. No, he can rejoice because there is a Redeemer for those waiting for redemption. Wives, learn of this woman who had no husband. To speak of her Redeemer to yours. Parents, is this the language of our parenting? Yes. Hey, Redeemer. You, child, are a mess. Sometimes you're a disaster. You're a sinful disaster. your children. You're disobedient. But you know what? Jesus died for disobedient children. You lie. But Jesus died for lying children. You are angry. But Jesus suffered the anger of God in place of angry children. Parents, is the language of gratefulness for our redemption, the language of our parenting, there is a redeemer. Let's let Anna teach us how to parent and to speak of him, to speak of his redemption. Think of your friendships in this church or elsewhere. 
is the language of gratefulness for our redemption the language of your fellowship? Are you allowing your voice to echo in the heart of those in this church that are in your group or serving next to you? Are, are, is your voice communicating to them? They is. Listen, our, our mouths are often filled with practical news and sports news and political news and, and those conversations have their place. But our accent, our tone, our, our language should be the language of Anna in the temple. There is a redeemer. The language of gratefulness. Aren't you grateful that he did not leave us alone? Aren't you grateful that he will return for us? We may have to wait eight years. We may have to wait a lifetime. But the Savior will come. Is this the language of our conversation with our neighbors? Gratefulness for the Redeemer. Is it the language of our conversation where we have opportunity at work, at school, with our extended relative? Is this the language of our conversation? There is a Redeemer. Is the language of gratefulness for the coming of Christ clothed in the good news of His gospel? Is that the language that we are speaking? Listen, brothers and sisters, if we want to see through her eyes, we must respond the way she responded. Seeing, we must be like her. And more importantly, hearing the good news of this word coming from God Himself, declaring has come. Yes. We must also give thanks to God and to speak of Him to all who are waiting. You know, right here, there's a room full of people waiting again for His redemption. Aren't you waiting again? Haven't you? had enough of the fallenness and brokenness of this age the anger and animosity that characterizes our world the selfishness and materialism and greed and complaining don't you see that in your own soul haven't you had enough of that in your own soul I have don't you have enough of idolatry and materialism and, and desperate self-centeredness? Don't you have enough of that? And aren't you also waiting for the redemption? And shouldn't we be able to speak that this Redeemer is coming again to bring His people to that ultimate redemption where we will, like Anna's father, was named to anticipate, see His face? Here is a room full of people waiting for his redemption. Let's let the language of gratefulness for this Redeemer shape our conversations. Shape our encouragement. Shape our joy. Brothers and sisters, our eyes or not. We need to see through the eyes of others. And seeing through their eyes, we can join their song. Let's pray. Anybody want to come? Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to redeem us. Well, I want to pray in particular for any this morning who identify with this woman specifically in her loneliness.
The psalmist writes, My father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. But even when those closest to us have gone from us, what that effect of this fallen world is, is extremely painful. Pray uniquely for them right now, Lord, that you would impart the joy of your salvation. Lord, that your redemption, all those who are lost and alone, and most importantly, separate from you, would bring joy this morning. Or it may be true that seeing you we are able to lose all else and in all else to remain grateful personally for you. Receive our gratefulness, Lord. Receive our song, fixing our eyes on you. Let's stand and sing.